So I'm happy to introduce the, uh, the moderator for our, our last session this afternoon, another postdoc colleague of mine, uh, Tate Paulette, who will be moderating the, the final session before our closing plenary. All right, thanks very much, Matt. Um, so, um, wait, got to speak right into it like that. Wow, okay. Uh, all right, so um, as was the case earlier, we're gonna uh, have plenty of time for discussion at the end of the session, so please just save uh, your comments and questions until then. Uh, our first speaker this afternoon will be Hugo Benavides, professor of anthropology at Fordham University. Uh, he has written extensively on the politics of representation, identity, and domination in Ecuador and Latin America more broadly from a variety of angles, uh, but with a particular focus on the role of archeology, span history, and memory. Uh, his books include Making Ecuadorian Histories, Four Centuries of Defining Power, The Politics of Sentiment, Remembering and Imagining Guayaquil, and most recently, Drugs, Thugs, and Divas, Telenovelas narco and Narcodramas in Latin America. Today, he'll be presenting a paper titled History, Capitalism, and Postcolonial Identities, an archaeology of the future. Please welcome Hugo Benavides. Benavides. <laughs> you the light? The light? Yeah, I turn it on because there's no way to do anything. Uh, uh, hello, everybody. Does that, does that work? Okay. Um, so I'm asking them to put the lights on because I don't have any slides, and you guys are going to go fall asleep anyhow, so hopefully <laughs> this way. Uh, one of you asked me if I was going to like put you guys to sleep, and I may. I'll try my best not to, but I don't have any slides, as I said. But if you do fall asleep, I won't take it personally. No worries, just don't snore, and I'll be fine. So this actually goes. Okay, thank you, Matt, so much for the invitation. Thanks um, for everybody making this such a really kind of smooth um, conference in terms of the logistics. I want to particularly thank you because I think it's been a wonderful uh, couple of days. And again, I think it's just amazing to have this kind of spaces that actually are great, as um, Andy was saying, to reflect, right? To sort of stop for a moment and think about our work and sort of wonder what it is that we know, as um, Luann was saying, and not do, right? So thank you so much for that space of sort of thinking, reflection, disagreement, but also of breaking bread. I, I think that's really important as well, of having dinner together and having wine and sort of recognizing what also unites us in a very profound way. So thanks very much. So um, this talk today, and I, I've sort of timed it for 20 minutes, so I really hope not to go over that, over that um, takes me back to my doctoral work in terms of the politics of archaeology and the politics of the past. I'm really concerned with how uh, we sort of make uses of the past, particularly in constructing identities, particularly in constructing post-colonial identities. One of my concerns for the last, I would say, 20 years has been particularly sort of the idea of modernity and how is it that Europe and the Americas entered modernity at the same time, but somehow Europe appropriated that modernity and the Americas continued to be these primitive and savage people, right? So I'm kind of really interested in this sort of hierarchical understanding of modernity and particularly then for this um, talk, I was really thinking about how issues of time, truth, and memory enter into that negotiation, right? So this particular project that I started a while ago and that just fit perfectly into um, what we are thinking about here is sort of looking at science fiction texts, looking at science fiction texts and dystopic texts, both being produced in Europe and both produced in Latin America, um, and sort of to use them to tease out the role that the past plays in the construction of identity. I had something very ambitious, as most of you, when I wanted to do this, which was compare a um, science fiction novel, a British science fiction novel by Christopher Priest called The Affirmation with Roberto Bolaños's 2666, right? Not gonna happen. Uh, I tried really hard, I plowed through the novel and I didn't get very far. So uh, this is the first part of the paper actually, which is fine because it's too long anyhow, right? But uh, so that'll be sort of like a second moment to, to think about that. And I'd love to actually start thinking about that in the discussion as well, okay? So the title hasn't changed and I'll be reading from this text. It's really hard to read with a microphone in front of the text. So I'm gonna try to do that. Tell me if, it, if, I, if you don't hear me or something. Okay, great. <clears throat> the human body was not made for capitalism. This is a quote by Eric Hobsbawm, which I would like to start with um, for this paper. 
For over five centuries, capitalism, as an ever-evolving socioeconomic system, has adapted itself to the shifting conditions and social structures of innumerable cultures. It has accomplished this in spite of what Eric Hobsbawm, uh, in spite of what Herrick Hobsbawm says in this epigraph so, elo so eloquently, that the human body and therefore social groups have been so negatively affected by the system. The logic of capitalist reproduction has been the focus of social theorists for at least the last two centuries. And to that respect, archeologists have not been foreign to or excluded from this debate. Since Gordon Child's early discussions about the social dimensions of early human labor production to the current debates of the World Archaeological Congress, the concern over more humane forms of social organization and livelihood have been at the center of anthropological archaeology. The current paper looks to contribute to this debate by assessing narrative of archaeologies of the future, particularly as they have been expressed in Western science fiction texts. Through them, I want to assess how does one account for such a pernicious system of exploitation and surplus extraction to have been normalized into a global paradigm? What are the comparative manners of assessing the ways that capitalism has permeated historical thought, produced ethnic identities, and ultimately redefined the way we think about culture from the inside out? And ultimately, how do, narrative, how do narratives of dystopic realities form part of our ongoing manner of Western self-representing, contributing to ongoing forms of political violence and conquest? The paper looks to address the manners in which capitalist identities, in the plural, have developed and permeate the material cultural landscape of the West. Ultimately, these texts and archaeological contributions provide insight into what Foucault and Spivak call, quote, the, hi the history of the vanishing present, unquote. These theoretical concerns are at the heart of so many political and economic struggles as they get played out in the narrative landscape of reconstructing a new history of places like South Africa, Ecuador, Mexico, and Somalia, just to name a couple. Ultimately, this engaged analysis will help us deconstruct and unimagine different systemic paradigms and the role that different archaeologies play in reclaiming and contesting levels of humanity lost over centuries of colonial and neocolonial forms of domination and control. And to that degree, further understand the manner in which oppression and identity are two sides of the same coin. Now I'd like to talk a little bit about Christopher Tex's The Affirmation. Christopher Priest's opening line, quote, this much I know for sure, unquote, invites us to believe that, we are re that what we are reading must be true. And as a reader, not surprisingly, we are easily comforted with this idea of truth, particularly in sense of escaping our already burdensome reality to curl up in another person's version of the truth, at least a narrative truth secured by the reality of actual words and pages. However, as the narrative evolves, we're no longer sure of anything, not only of what is true or not, or which of the two narratives as they start to become intertwined is real, but also of how does our own sense of self and memory enter into this narrative landscape. At the outset, we're invited to participate in the life of Peter Sinclair, a man who's going through a pretty rough patch. He has just lost his father, his flat, ended a long-term heterosexual relationship, and is seeking refuge, refuge in the cottage of an old friend. Once settled in, he thinks it might be a good, a good idea to fix up the cottage, which, like his life, is in a state of disarray. And not surprisingly, this fixing up the place where he lives until his writing out his life story, to see where it started going wrong, where did the first pieces of his life get lost, and perhaps a last-ditch attempt to bring all the pieces together, at least as he remembers them, in a way that is most authentic and useful. Quote, I perceived my past life as an unordered, uncontrolled bedlam of events. Nothing made sense. Nothing was consistent with anything else. It seemed important to me that I should try to impose some kind of order on my memories, unquote. At this point, we start realizing that we are in deeper than we thought, as is the case of our own lives. The book can easily be seen as an attempt at fictional autobiography, an archeology span of the self, an Escher-like narrative that leaves us wondering what color the figures, stairs, birds are, and in which direction are they really moving. The third chapter informs us that the first two are actually the writings of another Peter Sinclair that lives in another city who has just won the lottery. It would, be, it would seem to be a novel within a novel scenario. The lottery itself consists in the fact that he will have access to an operation to achieve immortality but he will suffer amnesia and no longer remember anything about his current life. This is why he's writing his autobiography, in order to remember something authentic about himself for after the procedure. 
However, in order to obtain the truth, he must deviate from the facts. After all, isn't that why we read fictional accounts like this novel? Because it is through lies, fictions, that we're able to find out something about ourselves. Quote, a higher, better form of truth, unquote. The narrative continues challenging us. Quote, if the deeper truth can only be told by falsehood, in other words, through metaphor, then to achieve total truth, I must create total falsehood, unquote. The truth of our lives, social spaces, and histories itself is by necessity, quote, an imaginary place and an imaginary life, unquote. By the end, we no longer what the truth, we no longer know what the truth is and begin to question our sense of factual reality. The narrative reminds us that the past is central to who we are and that the only way we can continue on living, constructing the present, is through an active reshuffling of our memories. And yet, that active search into our multiple past, both personal and social past, also means that the past is not dead, as William Faulkner pointed out almost a century ago. And therefore, quote, again, William Faulkner, the past is not even past, unquote. What does this mean in terms of a discipline like ours that polices or at least looks to control to find the past as if it was a factual reality made up of material culture that would allow us to infer from it other types of reality? Even though we know that the past is anything but past, we continue to build a discipline that must police it to the point of redundancy, with that same redundancy entering into our own lives at a very personal price. The relationship between a social past and a personal past at that point becomes a political question, an urgent one when that question takes place in a city like London that was the living capital of an empire that has survived on the extraction of resources and life from so many communities around the world. This makes us rethink the manner in which London's, London's past is reconstructed and reimagined. The multiple sites of the city are anything but local productions, but rather are part of an expanding array of relationships that have had multiple locations of operation, conceptions, penetration, and distribution. The identities created on the island of Britain and the Caribbean, to name one of its colonial strongholds, are multiply intertwined in ways that go beyond a hierarchical relationship of extraction. Perhaps this is an initial fallacy, to believe we're mere, merely reading or even interpreting the material record. To recognize the uneven exchange, exploitation really, of multiple Caribbean communities by the British is but the icing on the cake that only but hides the real dimension of the palimpsest. One doesn't go only in one direction, but in multiple ones, just as this book does all the time. As Jean Rees also explored in her hunting text, White Sargasso Sea, there's a horrible secret in Jane Eyre's in Europe's, in Europe's closet, an oppressed dark female body that is 10 times more oppressively present in the British ima imagination, and I think here of the mummies in the British Museum, right, than there in the Caribbean, right? When I was teaching in London, I always used to use this example for the students and saying like, the mummies didn't want to come to London, right? They were brought against their will, and then the Brits were scared of them, right? It's like, well, why did you bring them? Right? Like you're haunted by your own actions, not by the mummies themselves, right? So the key, therefore, I would argue, is to go further into that closet of madness that is actually both the British and Caribbean past, not as two sides of the same story, that would be another fallacy, but the same story told in different ways at different times and by different people, but somehow still the same story, same past and present and plausible futures. This courage to rescript one's memories is what both Peter Sinclair and Bertha in Jean Rees's novels do. And in doing so, they brav bravely are able to abandon that singular positivistic all-defining seeing I and I, right? The individual I and the seeing I, right? That has constituted a scientific approach of the past that is contained, sanitized, and above all, with, from which profit is gained, right? Either through museums or through universities or through visiting sites, right? So in symbolic and financial forms of capital that end up being the same thing. Only this scientific presumption would allow generations to study at Oxford and not be bothered that it was slaves that built those holes of learning, and not just simple mercantile expansion. But what, is the, what does one do with those black and brown bodies that refuse to die? Like Peter Sinclair, we seem to have won the lottery to a surgical procedure that brings in mortality, or a form of historical permanence of the West. But it comes along with an amnesia that disembodies past and present and future as well from any authentic or organic connection. 
The amnesia surgically removes, as if it was a social sickness, the complicit memories from the malleable, malleable histories of the social, malleable histories of the social bodies. The complicit memories that do not allow for easy consumption and categorization, that don't allow history to be divided into good and bad, but a larger palimpsest of narratives and meanings that are continuously recombined and reconverted in multiply problematic, ambiguous, and hegemonic ways. As Foucault states in the opening line of his article, Nietzsche, Genealogy and History, quote, genealogy is gray, meticulous, and patiently documentary. It operates on a field of entangled and confused parchments, on documents that have been scratched over and recopied many times, unquote. The past, that is what we formalize into history, is far from singular events, but rather multiple entangled ones that rewrite their meanings as they're being reinscribed by our reading, interpreting them on the material record. The challenge, therefore, is to reread these texts, the past or lives, without attempting to have them not be reinscribed in particularly problematic ways. Rather, it is these particularly problematic reinscriptions, the palimpsests, that can give us close clues to the truth or a limited history of the vanishing present as it is, that is being actively reconstructed by our own very will to exist. And after all, that is the affirmation that the text, by using that title, ultimately looks to impose upon us. The problem is not that the past does not exist, but that it is much more complex than anything we could ever completely grasp or understand. The key being, in particular, moments that allow us to reinscribe re notions of identity as connected beings with the past, and through that past, connect to communities century befo centuries before we were born and centuries after we will die. And it is in those reinscriptions, rearticulations, that we can also find our demise, the destruction of a Western obsession with history as an ethnological tool of ordering that is as arbitrary as the multiple stories as truth and lies that have been told about our and other people's pa past. As a matter of conclusion, I actually want to um, start with a quote by Walter Benjamin um, that goes like this. Quote, the superficial inducement, the exotic, the picturesque, has an effect only on the foreigner. To portray a city, a native must have other, deeper motives, motives of one who travels into the past instead of into the distance. A native's book about his city will always be related to memoirs. The writer has not spent his childhood, childhood there in vain, unquote. Science fiction texts engage in one way or another with the evidence that the past or the future is anything but the past or the future. Rather, they elaborate how past discourses, supposedly buried and extinct, are the ones that continue to fuel the present and are central to our contemporary existence. They share archaeology's premise that the past is precious and needs to be dug, interrogated, questioned, and faced in order to come to terms with the entities they have created or selves. However, this is where the first difficulty appears. It is impossible in any outright manner to distinguish between the subject being seen and the subject doing the scene. In other words, any belief in clear facts that separate and protect one from the other is really a fantasy, a suspension of reality. This is exactly what nightmares are made of. Arbitrary division of spaces, spaces, nations, and urban centers that don't exist other than in the horror that has been re recreated by imperial and colonial expansion. Capitalism, as an adaptive mode of socioeconomic livelihood, becomes the central factor in the production of histories and identities. The elements of our past that have been put into motion, that have put us into motion, are so impersonal and yet have been inscribed in our very skin tones, in the surnames of our fathers, not our mothers. This, in a manner, belies how certain patterns, patriarchy, homophobia, misogyny, are sustained and central to this capitalist form of extraction, making the role of the father vital in the enslavement of oneself or in one's refusal to engage with one's own multiple histories. Not surprisingly, London Town has, re has a reified role in the patriarchal history of capitalism. And this is also where language and culture play an important role as well. It is not only commodity values that have been reinscribed in our and the other's body, but also reinscribed in the language that sustains our legacies, both in literature and in our daily speech in the same language that I'm using today. 
This is why it is not shocking that William Shakespeare occupies the place that he does in world literature, and why his most well-known tragic figures are exactly those that valiantly return to face the struggle with those entities that have made them who they are, even if that might be an incestuous uncle and mother, or three witches brewing your heart's desire at the very outside of the play. As James Baldwin states, quote, my relationship then to the language of Shakespeare revealed itself as nothing less than my relationship to myself and my past. Under this light, this revelation, both myself and my past began slowly to open, perhaps the way a flower opens at morning, but more probably the way an atrophied muscle begins to function, or frozen fingers begin to thaw." Unquote. Baldwin's intimately frightening path might indicate a plausible productive future for archaeology. Many members of our social bodies have been thawed out of existence, or in Eric Wolf's term, supposedly been left without histories. This is far from the case, which has only contributed to further animosities that only reflect siblings' bickerings at their father's home. There is no doubt that the West's past is not an innocent one, or for the squeamish, but its plurality is what we have, and which unfortunately has been consistently betrayed in the, in the production of an impossible, singular, and monolithic history that is unable to represent or recreate who we are. It is this heavy burden that Hobsbawm's initial paragraph, epigraph so monumentally contains. Quote, the human body was not made for capitalism, unquote. In this fashion, it is not a coincidence that Frankenstein is also a British creation, because in many ways that narrative about modern man, written by a woman, exemplified centuries of monstrous production of our Western selves. Frankenstein, as we now know, is ourselves, and that same other, many times denied in the modern capitalist production enterprise. The monster is not called Frankenstein other than because he is Dr. Frankenstein's son. Like us, the monster is an innocent stepchild of modernity's ever-expanding wish to know and control that which is uncontrollable, ourselves. Archaeology, without a doubt, has been an innocent and at moments not so innocent stepchild of modernity's expansion. But as the monster we have created, archaeology also strives to exist in an other setting, in an other landscape than in the howling northern wind being constantly chased by the homicidal father. And archaeology's growing scholarly interest in other authors like Foucault and Spivak come to mind as somewhat hopeful in this regard. It is time for the discipline to accept that among all the fictional constructions we have produced, there is no more monstrous one than the belief it has a secure hold on empirical truth and material culture. In a way, one is reminded of Ralph um, W. Emerson's observation about the illusions of traveling, and that scholarship like traveling might be, quote, a fool's paradise. I pack my trunk, embrace my friends, embark on the sea, at last wake up in Naples, and there, besides me, is the stern fact, the sad self, unrelenting, ident identical that I fled from, unquote. Perhaps we might start understanding how archaeology's disciplinary boundaries only keep us inside a frightened history of oppression and do not allow us to connect to that horrid but organic mixed palimpsest that is our past and our futures. Thank you. All right, thanks very much. Um, our next speaker will be Chris Whitmore, um, associate professor in archaeology and classics at Texas Tech University. His research revolves around things, land, human ecology, the built environment, and memory, with a particular focus on southern Greece, northern Britain, and Norway. He has also been engaged in a broader effort to explore the character uh, and scope of archaeology as a discipline through examination of its objects, practices, and rapport with what has become of the past. His books include Archaeology in the Making, Conversations Through a Discipline, co-edited with Bill Rathje and Michael Shanks, Archaeology, the Discipline of Things, co-authored with Bjorner Olson, Michael Shanks, and Timothy Webmore, and the upcoming Old Lands, a Choreography of the Eastern Morea, Greece. Today, he'll be presenting a paper titled Hypanthropos, how might archaeologists approach that which is in excess of monstrosity? Please welcome Chris Whitmore. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Does, this, does this work? Do you hear me through the lapel mic? I may have. Yeah. 
There it is. Well, I mean, I'm close to that, so I'll be over here. All right. Yeah, I've got it. Thank you. <laughs> what happened? What do you see? What am I doing? Here we go. Um, thank you all. Thank you all for being here. And I, I want to start by thanking Matt. Thank you for the kind invitation to, to return to Joukowsky Institute. It's good to be among so many friends. Um, thank you to Jess Porter, uh, who always makes this so easy. I, I'm grateful to her and also Sarah, Sarah Sharp, who work behind the scenes and don't always get acknowledged, I guess. Um, although here, that's not necessarily always the case. Um, my aims in this presentation are more modest than what the title would seem to suggest. Um, first, in adding a new addition to that growing lexicon of neologisms that are associated with the so-called Anthropocene, um, this essay lends definition to the question, actually, of which Anthropos, by sizing up a humanity in excess of monstrosity, a humanity that is actually beyond Leviathan. Hypanthropos is more faithful to that metabiotic agency we encounter today in possession of a terrible efficacy, uh, one even Atlas would not have dared to shoulder. Second, I wish to draw out or draw our attention back to locality and to a longstanding attribute of archaeology as bearing fateful witness to human-induced metamorphoses. And here I address the issue of approach through really a brief consideration of, of the photography of Edward Batinsky, which are gonna, is going to repeat throughout my presentation. So, 9 a.m., October 26, 2010, Three Gorges Dam achieved its high water mark. An article published in the Xinhua, uh, Xinhua Net at website, this is the information outlet for the Xinhua News Agency, what is self-described as an important information organ of the central government celebrated the 175-meter achievement, this event, as a triumphal milestone. Amidst select quotes uh, expressing collective pride, evoking increasingly an increasingly beautiful scene, how's it go, filled with increasingly dense shipping traffic, the article mentions the sundry achievements that accompanied the 16-year construction of the world's largest dam, what it's styled as the world's largest water control and utilization, utilization project. Of course, nothing was said of the environmental catastrophes that had resulted from flooding 660 kilometers of narrow Yangshi River Valley with nearly 40 billion cubic meters of water. By 2010, the dam had already been implicated in drought, the disappearance of plant and animal species, numerous landslides, and these actually alone resulted in surface waves that claimed dozens of lives, hundreds of earthquakes, the spread of schistosomiasis, which is a blood parasite that's found uh, in snails that are thriving downstream in downstream fields that are no longer burdened with flooding, increasing salinity in the Yangtze estuary, the displacement of 1.2 million people, and a thorough, the thorough obliteration of the cultural heritage and material past within the valley. Alarmed at the prospects of such, a pros of such a project, anthropologists, biologists, environmentalists, geologists, and others had warned of these catastrophes before the engineering crews unpacked their theodolites. Few, however, had predicted that the construction of the dam would ever so slightly alter the rotation of the Earth, increasing the length of day by microseconds, further oblating our already imperfect planetary sphere, causing it to bulge slightly at the equator and actually shifting the position of poles by centimeters. Now, archaeologists are no strangers to the radical agrarian alteration of land, the deforestation of mountains, island ecologies wholly transformed or drained marshes turned deserts. In this setting, I need not pander to our familiarity with past environmental degradation and destruction Akin to standing beside urban residents who describe the countryside as a pastoral Arcadia, archaeology has repeatedly called out the habit of declaring our times to have achieved the human dimension unlike anything previously experienced. Entire landscapes of modification from Iberia to the Balkans to the Caucasus testified to the rule that agrarian interventions multiplied many times over adds up. And yet, what are we archaeologists to make of 
objects in excess of monstrosity, of things that vastly exceed our previous grounds for comparison. Understanding a greater than gargantuan object with planetary efficacy is not like standing atop the, uh, on top of the Three Gorges Dam. It more than dwarfs us. It's, neither is it akin to looking at water level indicators. It cannot be measured locally, nor can it be understood in terms of a generation, for it blasts its presence into deep time and reaches ahead of itself into distant futures. All other pasts, all of the pasts, are devoured by these mega monstrosities. This isn't even Nietzsche's critical history. Hugo mentioned this great piece by Foucault. This isn't Nietzsche's critical history. This is an ambivalent history. No, it's not even that. It's a species of apathetic annihilation, bootstrapped by the necessity of a projected futurity. futurity. Those Iberian, Balkan, and Caucasian uh, farmers never plowed their way into the ground to the point of affecting the spin of the earth. Measuring Earth's oblateness requires an all four capacity beyond the reach of ancient woodcutters in the Peloponnese. Easter Island was not overrun in the course of a decade by an agency equipotent to a tsunami, one that scours out everything suggestive of a before, one that exceeds its short-term presence and extends that into long-distance futures. Three Gorges Dam took 16 years to complete, yet its gargantuan imprint ensures its geostory will be written into the deep time of geology. Still, the world's largest dam seems rather minuscule when compared to the wider statistics related to global concrete use and dam water tables. And this, these are just two sets that I'm grabbing at random here. Over the last two decades, more than half the concrete ever produced was poured, mixed, and set. As for water control and utilization projects, more than one large dam has been built every day, every year for the last 60. These interrupt sediment flows, causing deltas to subside all over the planet. And here we encounter just a few examples of how humanity, through its machinations, has become a geological force whose memories, most geologists now agree, will stand out in the 4.5 billion year archive of human history or Earth history. The term Anthropocene was introduced as a potential label for this new geological epoch initiated by human activity. Yet, what precisely is this elusive agency capable, that, that, what is this elusive agency that's capable of changing the rotation of the Earth? To what generalized Anthropos are we actually referring? And this is a key conundrum as the Anthropos and the Anthropocene, you know, that said behind this, radical transformation, it remains unspecified. Indeed, so long as the figuration of human action is considered at the level of individual or society, we are, as you might now say, effectively firmly stuck in the Holocene. The Anthropos of the Anthropocene differs significantly in terms of speed, scale, assemblage, Laurent was on to this yesterday, and action. And this Anthropos, however, is unlike any Anthropos known to our forebearers those who understood humankind as morals subject to death in contrast to the gods. Now, anthrop the Anthropocene seems to implicate each and every one of us, over seven billion humans, as perpetuators of these, in these catastrophic times. Indeed, the whole of our burgeoning humanity, whose population has nearly tripled since 1950, is both equally responsible and equally in danger. This term is blind to the radical inequities that exist in the distribution of accountability and burden. Moreover, many of our archaeological colleagues would have the responsibility extend into the deep, into the, deep into the past as if humankind were set on this trajectory from the start of the Neolithic. This move is so suspect, it's beyond suspect, it's in terms of politics and time. For one, it buys into, let's call it the polite sham, of an all-inclusive anthropos and deflects blame from those power brokers that excrete and destroy the most. For another, even if one doesn't fully subscribe to this progressive image of a homogeneous time which feeds into a technocratic, accelerated capitalism, by shifting the start earlier, archaeologists underwrite a defunct 19th century evolutionary discourse where an unfortunate outcome that is our calamitous times, is, 
regarded as inevitable. Such is hardly the case. With 7.5 billion humans, I recognize that the politics of the Anthropocene cannot be the same as the politics of the environmental movement as it was in the 1970s. However, one cannot lose sight of the fact that today's poor and dispossessed, mostly children, are on the front lines of a catastrophe driven by the greed of a comfortable majority and a complacent, or sorry, let's say a comfortable minority and a complacent majority, forgive me. Tomorrow, everyone else will join the vanguard. And here, any gains are but temporary, as Deepesh Chekhabarty puts it, with no lifeboats for the privileged few of the technocratic elite. Yes, we are in this. We are all in this. But it doesn't cut to the truth measured in degrees. One should not mistake the Anthropocene for being anthropocentric. Humans in themselves are not at the helm. What of the greater than gargantuan metabiotic assemblage that amplifies the so-called anthropic power to parity with geological forces. Anthropos has been on the planet for tens of thousands of years without ever impacting the spin of the Earth. The members of this erstwhile Anthropos understood their lot as conditioned by relations that did not rely on them, that operated without them. They understood humanity's finitude and Earth's infinity. Now that we comprise a metabiological agency whose dimensions stretch from slowing the earth to the radical modification of the microbial. That old image, as the French philosopher Michel Serre po po points out, is actually reversed. Witness now a biogeological entity whose power would seem infinite and their world, by contrast, finite. This entity has replaced those non-human systems that did not rely upon it with, a synthetic, with synthetic systems that cannot continue without it. This is hypanthropos. Of course, the term evokes Tim Morton's hyperobjects, those things such as plutonium and styrofoam that endure across enormous swaths of time and space. Yet there is an important difference. One is political responsibility, but another is actually in the nature of the hype. The hype of this neologism holds on to the double meaning of both hyper and hupo, signaling something that is beyond anthropos, the Greek word hyper evokes largesse, excess, overwhelming being. It denotes crossing or passing over something. The Greek word hupo relates to a sense of under, beneath, below something. This we is simultaneously more and less. Hypanthropos is an outrageous, aggregate monstrosity. It is a we that can no longer trust the soil, the water, the air, or itself. It is a we that is both suspended above and below, without ground. But this we is not more than the sum of its parts. This hypanthropos differs from other entities in its material weight, its spatio-temporal vastness, but not in its ontological status. Hypanthropocene does not have the magnetic resonance of anth anthropocene, and I recognize it's common to the point of cliche to offer alternative labels for the term, but it must, we must do this. And though it is even more awkward, it is nonetheless even more faithful in signaling that strange and disturbing irony of what it is to be part of humanity at this moment, without enshrining Anthropos in that temple of pomposity, largesse. While Anthropos is a component of hypanthropos, not all Anthropoi are reducible to it. No individual Anthropos can be exhausted by it, and this, to be sure, is fundamental. A European-initiated technocratic form of civilization was given amplified efficacy through a new metabolic regime of fossil fuels, which was unknown to other anthropoi. Not all anthropoi constitute equal parts of hypanthropos, and these greater than giant things are not simply props for the spectacle of humans amongst themselves. Looking back, from at, it, looking back at itself from orbit, the luminescent Earth at night bears witness to humanity's new metabolism to its entangled relations with trillions of things, trillions of other things. So while Three Gorges Dam has become emblematic of this humanity beyond Leviathan, the cumulative effects of subsurface drilling for fossil fuels, giant craters of oil shale extraction, mountains of coal, and mountains leveled for coal, and a chain of giant boneyards suggest that it is uh, what is necessary to keep those lights going. A few more statistics actually will be illuminating. Um, between 1999 and 2011, in the same time it took to add another billion people uh, to the planet, billion humans, the automobile population increased by well over 600 million. 
Now to that, you have to add those hordes of commercial vehicles, lorries, buses, and coaches, increased by, which increased by nearly 250 million in number. So an internal combustion engine is now born almost as often as a human being. What population are we talking about? Yet by 2013, there was only one car for every 5.5 people on the planet. In the same year, there was an estimated, uh, say, 64 million kilometers of roads, paved and unpaved. That's enough to wrap the globe 1,605 times. Um, and we could continue around another 30 times, if you wish, with the existing 1 million plus kilometers of railroads. Behind the built environment of automobil automobility, we find giant craters from mineral extraction. Every year, Hypanthropos shifts three times more earth than all the world's rivers combined. Think about that, three times more earth than all the world's rivers combined. Do children and those poor who live outside the comfort zones of automobility devour as many minerals and generate the same amounts of CO2 in the course of their daily movements? They certainly do not consume enough quanti uh, consume quantities of uh, beef, which necessitates a global population of 1.5 billion methane belching cattle. Methane, by the way, is a greenhouse gas that's 21 times more potent than CO2. So dealing with something beyond gigantic, with something that is greater than monstrous, may lend itself to awe and wonder or disorientation and destabilization. It is also numbing. The repetition of such statistics tend to throw one into a state of what Robert McFarlane, in a riff off Shana Nege, I believe is who originally coined this term, sublimity. That combination of stupefaction and sublimity, which can be defined as the aesthetic experience in which astonishment is unified with boredom, such that we overload on anxiety to the point of outrage outage. McFarlane may be correct about a cure. Art and literature may help shock us out of our sublime stupor in a way that fact sheets of science cannot alone. So thus far, I've resisted uh, overly framing the photographs of Edward Bertinsky. Um, given the fact that we, uh, they have been accompanied by my words, I've also relegated them to a supporting role, one that is at variance, actually, with Bertinsky's mode of exhibition. Large prints, up to five feet across, displayed on white walls, invite observers to contemplate and, and or converse. Um, just as often, they demand a reaction, opening a window onto the gigantic, the large print dominates the viewer, an experience that is both humbling and demanding. Excluding the horizon, a wall of texture, compressed through the use of light and optics, challenges the viewer, the viewer's ability to define the spatial. The ambiguity of scale and perspective further unsettles as one is lured into searching for reference points, markers, any objects that might suggest a sense of size and dimension. There is something to be said for the power of the photograph as an object, as a lure for feeling. There is something to be said for the powers of ambiguity without measured frames, overly ordered and thus seemingly mastered. There's something to be said for photography as a practice in itself, as a mode of engagement. And I want to bring the discussion back around to the issue of composition. Yes, in the photographic sense of positioning, arrangement, focal length, and the uh, congruity of elements, but also in the larger sense of what makes up this hypanthropos. Bertinsky's photographs opening, open carefully composed windows on human interventions of land, giant mining craters, landscapes of oil extraction, refineries, what becomes of fossil fuels, cemeteries of derelict petroleum, metabolizing machines, tailing streams left over from nickel extraction, and the industrial supply chain behind consumer goods. Bertinsky lifts the veil of obscurity that lies over the unseen consequences of our choices, the impact of our lifestyles. He has an agenda. Nonetheless, deep quarries, colossal open pit mines, massive oil tankers, titan pillars of concrete exert their influence. The magnitude and idiosyncrasy of his objects demands a particular mode of engagement. Visualizing forms through a four by five view camera, Bertinsky finds his way to an image slowly, seeking out the right angle, having a form reach out, waiting for the right light, and being viscerally moved through the surprise of an unanticipated effect. In the work of Bertinsky, we encounter both a re relevatory attitude and a concern for ruination, 
the scars of hyperanthropic intervention and the overwhelming efficacy of giant objects, or beyond giant objects, as we should say. This proliferation of toxic pasts is, as Laurent stated yesterday, fundamentally archaeological. And I've left the, the question of approach to these last paragraphs, and this is by design, I assure you. Pratinsky's haunting cascade of images stands as a challenge to archaeology by manifesting the form of hypanthropic objects, a term that I have maintained here as opposed to hyperobjects, given the question of accountability and ultimately justice. These are not matters exclusive to archaeology, of course, as an academic discipline. Rather, they connect to archaeology as a kind of general attitude, um, something we actually heard earlier in Hugo's message. Uh, at the root, this pertains to that old antiquarian tradition of modest yet faithful witness by writing, photogra photographing, documenting hypanthropic things and their cataclys cataclysmic outcomes. We not only address our own complacency in that which is in excess of the monstrous, we reveal the truth which those fork-tongued things continually spin to their benefit. So follow the industrial chain and expose a different story. Seek out hypanthropic things. Scrutinize their indelible and massive material memories. Reveal the undisclosed consequences of this pervasive devastation. Anticipate the profound after effects yet to come. Root out the inequities associated with that which is an excess or monstrosity. Offer alternatives. We have a vast reservoir of things suggestive of other ways of living, which actually has been consigned to us, which can actually help in also shaping our futures. That is, so long as they are not devoured by hypanthropos. No, we cannot always all be Bertinsky. Um, there's only one, one Bertinsky. Still, a long roster of concrete things manifests as a litany of well-composed photographs combined with an archaeological imagination may yet shock more of us out of our comfortable complacency, our delirious ease, our absolute stublimity. Thank you. All right, uh, thanks very much. Uh, our final speaker this afternoon will be Uzma Rizvi, Associate Professor of Anthropology and Urban Studies at the Pratt Institute of Art and Design, and also visiting scholar in the Department of International Studies at the American University of Sharjah in the United Arab Emirates. She specializes in the archaeology of urbanism in Pakistan and the UAE, in both cases focusing on the third millennium BCE. Her work employs poetics as a means of pushing the limits of archaeological theory and engages especially with ancient subjectivity through the idea of uh, an intimate architecture, through examination of war and trauma in relation to the urban fabric, and through an epi uh, <coughs> epistemological critique that attempts to decolonize archaeology. Her publications include The Handbook of Postcolonial Archaeology, co-edited with Jane Lydon, Crafting Resonance, Empathy and Belonging in Ancient Rajasthan, and Decolonizing Archaeology on the Global Heritage of Epistemic Laziness. Today, she'll be presenting a paper titled Future Participle Towards a Speculative Archaeology. Please welcome Uzma Rizvi. All right, thank you. I'm going to do the same thing. Can everyone hear me? Yeah. Oh, great. Fantastic. Um, I, too, will begin. Where is Matt? Fantastic job. Like, I really enjoyed the day. And you've really curated the papers very well because I think they're all speaking to each other, especially within the sessions that they're in. So thank you for the invitation and for this. Thank you to Jess and Sarah. They did like just a great job, the Joukowsky Institute. And thank you to my fellow participants. This has been really fantastic, and I've really enjoyed everyone's papers. All right, so we're going to begin in, uh, I don't know, after that depressing paper, I'm not quite sure how one begins. So we will begin where we will begin. Right? This is a quote that Ansel Franke um, had first said to me in like 2006 or 2008 as a curator of a show called of Animism. And then it went into the publication, the future is now behind us and the past approaches us from the front. And it really uh, kind of 
made me do some brain yoga, right? What does it mean to be a approached by the deep past? What, is it, what does that approach actually mean? In designing research methodologies, a basic assumption is that we, as archaeologists, approach the past. But what if, for a moment, we consider that it is not we who determine the outcome of our research, but rather it is a negotiation, mediation, collaboration, conversation between many human and non-human stakeholders and participants? What we write up in our reports as caveats to our research, the various criteria that we cannot control but significantly alter the results of our work, like environmental conditions, ground cover, etc., that they be considered not only something we cannot control, but an actor, a stakeholder, a participant in the discussion of our research. In some part, and to be honest, this realization has become unavoidable because the Earth is no longer languidly communicating, rather it is starting to raise its voice. And just today, there was a 7.0 earthquake in southern Japan, right? So this is not like, we're, not we're actually not making this up. Um, it may be raising its voice, or perhaps we are relearning a forgotten form of communication. In a time when the past was still relegated to the past, the future seemed unknown. And in a contemporary moment, whether we consider it to be the Anthropocene, or as Donna Haraway has argued in a feminist critique of the Anthropocene, the Capitalocene or the Plantationocene, etc., the future seems quite certain in its possibilities, and the past quite speculative, or at least open to a moment of speculation. It is in that contemporary moment, and in this contemporary moment, that I'm interested in capturing the sliver of possibility. I just need that one crack. The moment of recovery of the past may be more speculative, and to consider this as an emancipatory and decolonizing gesture on archaeology's part. Faye Harrison famously asked in Decolonizing Anthropology 25 years ago now, if we might imagine an emancipatory, reconciliatory, and liberated field. I believe that decolonization requires a conceptual rupture in order to be realized. And perhaps the discomfort that we have with a speculative moment is precisely the rupture that archaeology needs. As one, is, as one of archaeology's deep assumptions, knowing that we are engaged in a well-educated, highly argued, expert-proof, theorized reconstruction of the past based on multiple lines of evidence, still remains a slight bit of speculation at its core. And rather than considering this to be something hidden, not talked about, or just gi a given, I would like to take that speculation and celebrate it, open it up, and see if it allows for a different way of understanding the methods and materials we work with in order to interpret the past. At the core of this project of decolonization is a necessity of the past to be speculative. In order to change, reorder, reorient our epistemological bearings, there must be a moment we capture that allows us to do this, to do just that. But this reorientation is not one that we can necessarily author, nor control, in fact. Perhaps, one of the ways in which I did it at least, perhaps to begin to understand how we might recognize it while it is happening, we m must first recognize it in retrospect. In 2003, during a survey in northeastern Rajasthan, I was engaged in a heated conversation with a peer over the ethics of participation that were being suggested for the community archaeology workshop that I was running. The Sarpanj, the Sarpanj is like the head uh, council of five villages. The Sarpanj of that area walked over to us. We were gesticulating wildly and our voices might have been raised a bit. The Sarpanj of the area walked over to us and asked us to remove our shoes and step to another patch of earth, one that was not so deplete of resources so as to help ease our conversation and energy flows to ease the conflict. In that moment, I considered the act to be akin to taking a breath and checking ourselves. You know, the one, two, three, take a moment. We did as we were told and ended up talking more about the act than what the disagreement was about. Now, if this land had not produced conflict, I might have taken this act more to heart, romanticized it, and considered it for everything it was worth. But there has been conflict in Rajasthan throughout history, these same individuals, right? And there continues to be conflict. What tools for assessment did I have at my Western disposal to make sense of this moment? So I walk into the sepia tone past and rearrange my own experience and thought that had we not done that act, perhaps our community meeting would have been organized differently. We might have interacted with our community partners in an emotionally exhausted manner and or this interaction might have left a trace on our relationship rather than us looking back on, on it in a wondrous manner. We might have let it negatively impact our working relationship. While in that speculative space of reordering, replaying and remembering and reconstructing, 
I realized that the strength of the speculative moment was actually not in any of those human-centered agentive possibilities, but rather the methodology of a speculative archaeology allows one to shift back to, into those spaces, allowing everything else to become more nuanced. This was actually not about me. This was about the soil. The soil upon which I stood had become a subaltern in its own narrative. That statement about moving from one patch of soil to another was said by a person of political stature, the st said the serpent. And that suggested to me that there was an importance of the soil in political consciousness, that existed, there existed an idea that the soil had an impact, that in some manner the soil was part of a public or political society. And here I'm using political society in the ways in which um, Chakrabarti has used it. This also meant that the soil as a thing not only had been silenced and rendered invisible, but that in including it had the potential of an act of epistemic decolonization in the field of archaeology. Um, I really wanted to put in lots of images of soil, but what happens is that when you start thinking about soil as subaltern, you begin to feel like you're exoticizing it. So I suddenly had no images to show you. I was like, I have to take them all out. I can't, I don't know how to deal with that. So just so you know why we're looking at a lot of text. It is at this juncture that it becomes imperative to be clear about the relationships between epistemic decolonization, the soil as subaltern, and the politics of things. Within this discourse, it will also become clear as to why we, as intersectional subjects, have a stake in the ontological discourse. We might consider this to be within the rhetoric of a symmetrical approach, in which all humans and non-human agents are placed within the same conceptual plane, although I understand that in 2015, just last year, there's been um, a different move in symmetrical um, archaeology or symmetrical approach. However, my issue has more to do with the language, right? It is precisely the recognition of inequality or inequity within that framework, and the danger in using a word such as symmetry that masks deep epistemic colonialisms. Implicit in the impetus to consider all things along the same philosophical plane, even though that was not the intent of when um, Whitmore and Webmore first published this and when Olson uses it, um, it, it a lot, sort of the impetus to consider all those things along the same philosophical plane is the elevation of non-humans into a categor categorical consideration equitable to that of humans, right? There's this idea that we're all there. The assumption there is, of course, that humans are in some higher conceptual, hi they're, uh, higher in some conceptual hierarchy, but that human is the normative, and here when we think human, I would actually argue that our human is, tends to be white, cis, male, heteronormative human, certainly not an othered body, not a body whose history is the result of colonization or body pieces afloat in the late capital marketplace. As one pushes the line of questioning further within a speculative space, it becomes imminently clear that not all human bodies are considered as precious as materials or lands or non-human elements such as currency. And so this project of identifying the politics of things must shift into some ontological anarchy, which allows for a reordering of this symmetrical plane for all intersectional subjects, be they human, non-human, anything else, really. And so let us allow for multiple ontologies, for the anarchy to create something different, something speculative, something emancipatory. In that space of recognition of intersectional subjects, we find ourselves deeply connected to the soil claiming kinship. If we approach kin-making with all things as making person or subject, not human or people, or if we think about genealogically, like thinking about us as being part of this larger family that goes beyond just humans, um, and we think about what Donna Haraway has suggested um, in terms of uh, kin-making with and around with materials, and I'll, and I'll quote her here, I actually think it's actually a very useful a methodological tool for speculative archaeology because it, it recognizes how we might be approached by research materials. And I quote, I think that the stretch and recomposition of kin are allowed by the fact that all earthlings are kin in the deepest sense, and it is past time to practice better care of kinds of assemblages, not species one at a time. Kin is an assembling sort of word. This is from her interview uh, just from last year that was published in Environmental Geography, I think. Within the possible methodology of a speculative archaeology as kin, we co-create our research and our project, and through that, our pasts and futures. This act of recognizing the multi-species becoming with, multi-species co-making, making together, it's kind of taking collaboration to the next step, I would say. This is actually an act of sympoesis uh, as compared to autopoesis. Autopoesis tends to be a self-replicating system that continues on. Sympoesis is a more collaborative where all of us are working together and building upon, which I think is a very generative and collective aspect of what a research project might be able to look like. Sympoesis allows for a becoming that moves in various scales of time with what Haraway has called multi-species species muddles. 
muddles. I just love that word, muddles. And takes into account all past becomings. And in a way that I'm suggesting it, um, it would be considered as a decolonizing future and potentially future becomings, right? Now, the future participle, this is, I, I use a lot of, I'm, I'm thinking a lot about language and the use of words and the use of language and the ways in which English actually is incredibly limited. Future participle in a grammatical code does not exist in English, actually, right? Thus, inherent in this exegesis of theoretical concepts, I actually cannot articulate the process of future becoming. Like, I don't have the word. We don't have the word. And so then there's an issue of theorists and archaeologists arguing, like if you think about future just as a theoretical concept, um, like I would say Paul Graves Brown does, he's already argued that the future is over. Right? So you have that aspect. You have the fact that in English we can't figure out how to say future becoming. And so what are we looking towards or looking forward to? Perhaps embedded in that very question is the linearity of such an imagination, that there's one way to look back and on that same track we look forward. It is somewhat of an imagined straight line, but actually, in my experience, being and becoming is never linear, nor is it straight. Having realized that English is somewhat limited in its ability to adequately account for future becomings, I would like to turn our attention to another language, Arabic. Perhaps one of the most colloquial words used in Arabic is the word inshallah. It links, and I'm, I don't know if anyone has heard this, but it's been used in many different ways, right? Um, it links time, and there's some sort of epistemic causality, which is usually not orthodox. Right, so in, in, in fact, what it means is God willing. But there's nothing really religious about this word at all, actually. Anyone who's ever worked in the Arab world or ha knows anyone in the military who's worked in the Arab world will know this. It links time, some epistemic ca uh, causality that is not usually orthodox and the future. And those familiar with its colloquial use will recognize the God willing nature um, as a word that is completely ambiguous, someone, somewhat unknowable and potentially unreliable like incredibly unreliable. In fact, if you want to be unreliable, you use the word inshallah, but not always, right? Inshallah pops out of a linearity and pushes us into the vague ambiguities of space. Although not usually considered a future participle in Arabic, the idea that the word in its very grammatical structure of the participle, that there is a possible future happening, whether or not you intend it to be. Right? There's a speculative nature to the word that provides the possibility of new words and new worlds with the new words. Rebecca Cliff and Fadi Helani refer to this as the inshallah turn as it marks a change or shift in a conversation topic. If we might exist in other languages without necessitating a linearity of time, then our approach to archaeology changes and the plausibility of archaeology or the deep past approaching us becomes possible. It reorders, realigns, and challenges our understandings of what the ontology of archaeology itself may be. The epistemic critique, then, is a destabilizing and derooting form of decolonial anarchy. The episteme of archaeology, however, is, sim is stronger than a simple a sort of phrase or a turn of a phrase, right? Inshallah is not enough to just pop us out of our deep epistemic um, holdings. Imagining a different future is central in that post-turn moment, however. How might one imagine a different archaeology, one that begins in a place of decolonized histories or roots, somewhere prior to the contemporary speculative realism and speculative fiction, is in fact the feminist response that has a deep history in utilizing utopic fantasies as a way to combat patriarchal narratives of contemporary life. It's interesting that we're using science fiction and speculative fiction in, in this, and we were also talking about Anthropocene. Um, in that capacity, our futures have always included parallel universes or utopic fantasies. For example, one of the earliest feminist utopic texts, Sultana's Dream, written in 1905 by Begum Rukaya Sakhavat Hussain, was published in the Madras-based uh, English periodical, The Indian Ladies' Magazine, in English. Right? In this text, the protagonist awakens into a gender role reversed world and takes a rocket ship to understand how the new political order makes sense to sovereign beings. In a more contemporary example of future dystopia, we might look to Octavia Butler's work. By locating the feminist project within an intersectional subject framework, Butler not only explores the relationship of future and race, but it is clearly within the framework of speculative realism. In 1993, when Octavia Butler first published Parable of the Sower, the first book in what had been intended to be a science fiction trilogy, she divined a future moment, 2024, which actually is not that far away, 2024, in which a young black woman would bring communities salvation in a post-apocalyptic moment. Our protagonist, Lauren Olamina, at 15, could feel the pain of others as she had hyper-empathy syndrome due to certain drugs her birth mother had been taking. 
Reversing the stigma of such diagnosis, hyper-empathy becomes the catalyst through which she leads people to believe in hope and change based on non-fixity, non-placeness, malleability, and empathy for everything. It was as if concerns of new materialists, materialisms, critical feminist theory, and science fiction found a birthplace together. It is only when we start in the future, in fact, that we allow for radical alterities to exist, even if it, it is only structuring our political philosophies and a culture of hope and change. It was late December 2012 when I was stood on the coast of the United Arab Emirates, which is where I'm currently doing my work, as the wind picked up sand and deposited on my face. I continued to wipe some mixture of sand and sweat off my brow as I poured over maps and thought about how one might locate the third millennium BC sites. Every time the sand approached me to be recognized, I wiped it clean. It took me quite some time to stop that action of erasing a history. Rather than thinking only about the third millennium BC sites, the gesture made me recognize the impact of those reclaimed beaches with sand shipped in from around the world. It moved me first to locate its own history, the history of the coastline, and through that to consider the ways in which populations of individuals have found themselves a part of that landscape. As part of my decolonized methodology that is steeped in colonial uh, community-based practice, I have spent the past three years getting to know locals, non-locals, communities, publics, and the precarity of the entire situation, all within a multi-species muddled form through which a sympoesis might be possible. It is by recognizing the sand that approaches me along the coast as cosmopolitan and non-local that the manners in which I theorize locality, local species, inhabitants, and histories has changed. This, I would argue, changes the future of archaeology. Well, at least in the UAE, inshallah. All right, thanks very much to our three speakers. Um, it's now time for discussion, so we're gonna open up the floor, and this can, of course, um, can of course comment on any of these three papers or from the previous sessions. And um, I don't know if we need mics, yes. So we have a, a traveling mic, uh, so please just raise your hand if you'd like to say something. This is just an idea for you, uh, Hugo. Uh, I don't know if you if you know the, the work by uh, Michel Le Certeau. He was a, he was a, a friend of, of Foucault, and in one of his book, it's, it's entitled uh, "The Writing of History: L'Écriture de l'Histoire." Uh, he developed an idea uh, about fiction, and he says what is what is fiction is not what is fictionous, what is uh, invented, what is imaginary. A fiction is something which is presented to be the voice of reality, to speak for reality. Uh, so uh, if you take that idea seriously, it's becoming interesting since, in fact, uh, history or archaeology, you know, when it is presented as being the reality, it has happened like that, it was like that, and more it is presented in that way, more it is fictionous in, in some ways. And so if you approach uh, history and the reconstruction of the past uh, through this uh, uh, approach, I think it's becoming very interesting, and, and, and you can deconstruct this uh, fictionous uh, reconstruction of the, uh, of the past. Or a comment. I mean, I, I I really enjoyed the inshallah point, um, and I I guess I'm thinking about um, from my own talk, I suppose to, to a degree, this sort of ontologies of time business, and it strikes me that you know uh, the issues we have environmentally right now are are partly that, right? I mean, one of the problems we have with climate change issues is people can't conceptualize temporalities at these scales. And they also can't wrap their heads around causalities of small scale choices and how they engage. And so I guess this is why I'm not sure it's a question or a comment, but it seems to me that this is something that archeology span needs to start speaking to, right? Which is that, uh, you know, one of our contributions is really this notion of thinking about process, about causality, and about time differently. And 
I guess what I, you know, I'm interested to start seeing more archaeologists bring to bear these different ways of, not only ways of being, but ways of sort of um, uh, imagining temporalities. And, and it seems to me that this is somewhere where we could bring together sort of highfalutin thinking on ontologies up against policy uh, in an interesting way. I don't know if any of that makes sense, but, it, but I, I guess it was just sort of thinking about the inshallah versus what Chris was showing us. It, it strikes me as there's something there. Um, I think what, what struck me about your paper, just going back to this ontology of time thing, is, is in policy, the government put in a decolonized way of thinking about time. Right, the fact that in La Paz you have the, like, you have the clock that has a backward time. So there are ways in which some, it I think it just depends on governance, and it depends on capitalism, actually. Um, we're just coming right back to you, Luanne. <laughs> um, and I think, it, uh, I think there are ways in which archaeology can influence, we have to start thinking about policy and, and the ways we do it. But I, I would look to cases, like I didn't know about that clock, like what, the, you know, and I think that's amazing. I think that's, like now I'm gonna go look it up and try to figure out how everyone can do that. You know, that's like a great way to just disrupt that kind of, um, that kind of way of being. But you also, like one of the things that I always struggle with, because I'm actually quite, prag I'm, a, I'm a pragmatist as well, oddly, like I'm kind of oddly a pragmatist. And so if, if we all had different forms of time in our, in our research work, then how would it speak to each other, right? And so we not only have to develop allowing that to happen, but then a way to actually have it in conversation with one another too. And that's, that's, our, that's actually our job. Like we need to kind of figure that out rather than relying on these older ways of being and just saying that, oh, because we can't, it can't be standardized, right? we can't talk to each other if you have a different form of time and I have a different form of time, to, to just take that as like, well, then we can't do anything, but to actually change the system so it can, or like to think about ways in which we can. I don't know if that answered or... <laughs> I guess a couple of things. One of them is this the story about Ecuador that um, you reminded me of, which is that they, they tried to do like um, what we do in the US, right, of sort of like changing back the clocks in the spring and the fall. So they did it in Ecuador, and all Ecuadorian citizens then had two clocks at home. You know, the one with the real time and the one with government time, right? And then, like, when you would meet somebody, they would say, like, well, is that real time or government time, right? So that meant it was a disaster, right? And the government had no choice but to take it away, right? And, you know, and I thought, again, of that failure as incredibly successful, right? Because here is it, you know, that, you know, um, Ecuadorians were saying, don't mess with time. Right, like you, you, you've already messed my whole life, but you can't mess with that, right? And it's funny to me how you know 300 million Americans, we just switch time like that, and it goes in a flow, right? And 10 million Ecuadorians or 50 million Ecuadorians can't do it, right? And the story gets told as a failure, but actually, I'm quite proud that we can't do it, right? And sort of going back to your comment, Laurent, which which it took me a little bit to to think about, right? I mean, it, it sort of reminded me, I guess, of your your paper towards the end, right? This idea um, of sort of that you told us a particular story about peasants in Africa, right? Or you emphasize a particular narrative, right? A particular part of the history, right? But you ended by saying, you know, but there's also lots of other things that I could have emphasized. And and they're all true. Right, but I am a limited person with limited time, and this is what I emphasize. Right, and and I think that that's really important. Right, it's not to say that things don't exist or not real. Right, but we also participate in that creation and that construction. So we're not reading, interpreting. And I think you pointed this out, like in the first, you know, keynote, like we're creating them. Right, and so you know, I just wrote this down, which I think to me was a way to understand it. Right, which is like, you know, what which story we. Right, which story we choose or we reify makes a difference, but it also makes us, right? And I think that's the part that we miss, right? That we're also constructing ourselves in that process and then creating other stories, right? So that we're intimately connected and interconnected all the time, right? So, yeah. Wizard 2 is uh, Jesuit. <laughs>
Okay, so what I'm concerned about is with this Anthropocene, um, those people in the world who are living on less than a dollar a day, having no concept of, of you know, this new era, uh, all of these uh, major, you know, changes that are being impacted on them, even though they may be hundreds or thousands of miles away. Um, how do we reach out and help those people? I mean, does there have to be like a new reorganization of development of, of um, you know, United Nations efforts or, or some completely different uh, structure? I'd like to hear some comments about that. <laughs> yeah, and you might be able to hear me without this, but but I think I'd like to just reinforce one more time. You know, I guess in a, in another context, but 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 we can think about them as being globally connected. The excess of monstrosity of three gorges is predicated on the existence of all those other people. That it's not separate from. It's part of the. I mean, that's part of the excess of monstrosity, right? you know, that, that we can do that hypo, but it's all built on the backs of 1.25 million people re relocated. Is that what, what it is, Chris? 1.25 million people moved out of the way of that development, right? So, don't even why they oh, I think they, well, <laughs> I'm not sure I'd agree with that because, you know, I mean, you know, how would we feel? It's like, well, I'm sorry, your life is invalid because it's in the way. You know, I, I bet they understand. I mean, maybe not the same way we would understand, but. Well, I. Thank you for your question. I mean, it's one that I actually think about quite a bit. And um, I think it begins with us. I mean, I think it begins right here with the kind of standards of living that we hold about how we live. When most people in certain neighborhoods in North Carolina live like Agamemnon, and seriously, if you compare the standard of living, the size of the house, what they actually consume, it is overlords of old. We live like, they live like kings. And that's the standard of living they subscribe to. So one of them is about completely rethinking what a standard of living is. Uh, that has to begin here. So that's part of this issue of then this larger question. How do we deal with that? Well, I mean, it's, it's mind-boggling. This, this is the stupor one begins to fall into because it's so difficult to begin thinking about these issues. Who am I, in a sense, to tell how, how, anyone how to live? I mean, that, that's, a, that's a major stumbling block that I already have. So, it begins with me. Yeah, I disagree with that as well. <laughs> well, that's, that's fine, but I, 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 I like disagreement. I just, I, I'm just not going to push myself on, on others. But well, no, no, I didn't, I didn't mean that, that, it's, that, that you're absolutely wrong, but I think one of the dangers of talking about these kind of situations is we always seem to fall back on that idea of, of personal and individual solutions. You know, what can I do? And, and you know, and that there are aspects of everything from the environmental, if everybody just recycled, you know, their tin cans, then maybe we wouldn't have an environmental problem. And that's where, you know, and that's part of the reason why I like to talk about capitalism, because it's a larger systemic thing. And I think, you know, questions about the archaeology of perpetrators. You know, who is at fault? It's not you and I, although we play our role in perpetuating it. Of course we need to think about that. Um, but the bottom line is, if you or I, you know, just vanished, you know, the system would continue on with all of those same structural dynamics. And so that's where I think we have to be very careful about, you know, about, about pointing fingers and talking about culpability. Ah, well, that was the point of my paper. <laughs> I know it and, was. And, and, but I, I but I, I disagreed with you. No, I think we're talking about two different things now. I mean, you asked a very valid question about how other people are living. They're living on a dollar a day and how they actually be, 
you know, come to understand they're part of this? Um, I think that's a very difficult question. M mine came back to the question of standards of living and also those who are culpable within that transformation, which is we absolutely have to call that out. So I agree with you there. But I think there are two different things. Um, it's a really difficult this is also what, I mean, this is what Dana, Donna Haraway was talking about in terms of capitalist scene, right? That it's actually not so much the anthropos and like the ways in which we as, because it's not everyone, everyone hasn't created this problem. There's a very specific system of capitalism that has created a very specific kind of problem that comes from a very specific kind of history of colonialism, right? So it's all actually kind of part of that larger narrative. And that system is much larger than you and me. I mean, like we can of course recycle. Right? But it's actually a systemic issue. Now, what, what are those people uh, under a dollar a day going to do? Right? What are we, what are we going to do? What is anyone going to do? When it, when, because as the world is shifting and changing, it's actually quite, um, it's, it's, it's actually quite uh, depressing. And it should be, right? It's actually, it is depressing and it should be because it's in fact, people don't have water. People don't have clean air. People don't have, already, already don't have all of these things. Right? One of the interesting, I worked with a community group um, in Tehran who was working on, uh, in, in Iran, working on clean air acts and everything. And one, then this was kind of a flippant statement that she said to me because I was like, I'm really concerned. How are we all going to survive this? What's going to happen? You don't have any air. Your children have asthma. What, what are we going to do? And she's just like, you know what? Whatever we're going to do, we're going to figure it out sooner because we're far more resilient than you guys are. And I was like, oh, you may be correct. For those people who are living like Agamemnon, like living these palaces, they, th that resilience isn't quite there, right? So th the reason speculative fiction becomes so interesting, the reason so many um, like uh, activists have been moving towards visionary fiction is because within like Octavia Butler's stories, it's a post-apocalyptic moment, and the people who have and the people who have survived I don't know where to put it. The people who have survived are in fact not those who usually are in power. It is it is in some ways it is the resilience of those who have always fought against a system. Right? That doesn't mean we're not concerned about those who are moving a dollar a day. I would say anthropologists should be more, and this is something I think you said as well, that we need to be more in policy, we need to be in government, we need to, like, like we need to produce more PhDs to go into those public sector works, even though you didn't say produce more PhDs, but I'm just throwing that in for fun. Let me can just briefly continue the Luan celebration round here. I mean, I think that in some ways coming, it comes back to your point about uh, new forms of collaboration, right? I mean, if, 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 if we take your sort of fantasy of dissolving, and I know that's not exactly what you said, but sort of the future of archaeology as being something very different, um, one could imagine a future here where archaeology is more collaborative uh, in, a, in, a, in a radically new way, right? A way whereby you're working, you know, with policymakers, with geologists, with, in this way that actually is cognizant of of what both archaeology can speak to, but also the need for the kinds of um, engaged scholars you were talking about, right? The kind of public intellectuals, which means being collaborative in an, in, in an active way that says, we can't do it alone, right? You do it alone, and policymakers and, and Republicans will say, oh, those anthropologists, or oh, those archaeologists. But if it's you and a geologist and a material scientist and, and like this army of public intellectuals, then suddenly academics actually do have a role that's very different than, than the current state of affairs in North America is. So, so yeah, it all, it all comes back to Luann. Um, <laughs> sorry. Thank you. Uh, I have a question about aesthetics. Uh, I've um, been thinking now through the presentations about um, how anthropology, or how archaeology, of course, is very focused on often the image and what the image does. And I was struck um, in the presentation um, with so many images of the uh, of the anthropocenic de destruction um, that those images um, were being critically presented. Uh, of course, but in a way they were still having their effect. They were still having their sublime effect. We are here in a theater, they're on a screen in that beautiful, you know, proscenium, uh, and we can sit back and look at them and admire them in some way and feel a bit of the terror about that. And it's not just the photography, the artists that can do it. Obviously, uh, the digital technologies that now are emerging 
within archaeology tend to do the same thing. And even though sometimes they are focused on a form of critique, uh, a form of reorganizing knowledge production, they're also still, in a way, aestheticizing in some aspect that is focused on that beauty. And it reminds me then, of course, of the ways um, that beauty works within the re its relationship to pastoralism, that there are people who can get on their boats and go away from the wars to a quiet place to contemplate, and they have the images to think about. And so I'm wondering if archaeology's images are moving towards a kind of pastoralism that is counterproductive to the battles that we're talking about fighting. Um, I, there was just a, Chris Rizuski in, who's in here participated in a very interesting uh, dialogue recently in Journal of Contemporary Archaeology about photography. And I know, Matt, you recently taught the piece that Bjorn and Tura wrote, and it was about this very point. Um, because they're aestheticized doesn't mean they're any less, that their, their faithfulness is any less than what they are. I mean, they have a fidelity to that thing that is there. And there's something to that that aesthetics can't wipe out necessarily. But there's also something to the aesthetics in terms of how it provokes a feeling and how it draws you in in that way. Yes, we're in a comfortable theater away from this, but part of it's also calling attention to that, which is actually covered up. This stuff gets covered up. It's way out there, away from these centers. I mean, it's, I showed you a few pictures from near Lubbock, where I live, but this is a very poor area that is there, and that's where these giant craters exist, and they're causing cancer rate 400 times the effect of normal cancer in these Native American populations who are actually digging in some of these uranium mines. I mean, we can go on and on and on. We have to get in the middle of that. So that's part of what archaeology is. Archaeologists go and get in the middle of that. Um, we deal with that material, and we have to come back here and share those images. That's, but Pratinsky did that, you know? He was there, he had an engagement. There was a way in which he engaged with those locations, and there was a thing, something that they demanded of him being there. Um, I think it's a very complicated issue you raised, but uh, this conversation deals with precisely that critique, and it's a very interesting one. It's worth, worth engaging with. Thank you so much. Uh, yeah, I, actually, uh, Chris, I, I, I had actually a very similar kind of re reaction that I felt that the pictures were, in some sense, I mean, perf the, performing an interesting kind of pedagogical job. I mean, on the one hand, you can read them in a sort of Russian formalist sort of way as a sort of, uh, uh, a sort of slowing down. We've talked a lot about that today. I mean, how do we sort of take certain kinds of scales of uh, vision and politics, and how do we sort of bring them down to force a particular kind of reflection about them? And there was something about that, but I also felt the, uh, the sort of the sublime effect of the beautiful monster, right, which both creates awe and paralysis at the same time, and in the end, there's no politics. And, and I have to say, I, what I felt most compa compelling about your talk was the numbers, that actually the return to the numbers, the actual sort of sheer magnitude and frightening nature of the numbers. I mean, when you, the, the, tilt, the re tilting of the, uh, of the earth on its own axis is completely mind boggling. And so I think there might actually be something about a return to just the, uh, uh, the sheer magnitude of the quantitative and actually a return to the actual sort of uh, sheer force of the facts, if you will. I mean, not, not, not one to sort of you know, revert back to a kind of positivist epistemology, but there is something to be said about that as an act of sort of pedagogical opening and conveyance as a form of exposure, if you will, or an ex exposition. Just because it's on, on the kind of the same topic, right? Um, Roberto Bolaño's 2666 actually has to do uh, with the feminicides in Juarez, right? And Matt being the beautiful human being and host he's been, is also applying through plowing through 2666, right? And one of the funny things is that it is about the feminicides, but it isn't, right? So what Bolaños does is actually something very different from these images. He doesn't center on the images. Right? He centers on the life of 
uh, academics that work on this German writer, right? He focuses on all these other elements, right, in which that part is also just another element of their lives, but it's more central to them than they actually know, right? And, and this is the first moment, actually, because we talked about this before and we couldn't really understand, but I think there's a beauty to that, of sort of decentering the image, right? Because these are women that are being killed because right, a complicity of the police, the state, transnational organizations, right, all kinds of things are happening. And one of the problems with the visual culture of these feminicides is that it reproduces them, right? It reproduces the, this violence and through this fascist kind of seduction, right, we're kind of enamored with these images that we should be horrified at, right? And I think this happens in the same way, right? And it's something really hard to escape from, right? And it's not only, right, Sebastián Salgado, right, all these actually photographers have to deal with this, right, in a way that they're trying to wake us up, but I think at the same time participate in reifying or reproducing that which exactly they're trying to get away from, right? In that way, I don't think it's different from archaeology, right? I mean, I really do think we're good guys, or we try to be good guys, but we're not. Right? It's like we're trying to do something and we end up doing the opposite without really understanding that there's a biggest systemic reality that's making us do those things. Right? So. I would like to make a case for the public archaeologists, the CRM people, as being far more effective in dealing with uh, public threats to the environment and so forth. And I'll cite a specific example from here in Rhode Island. There's a site called Great Salt Pond where a developer was scheduled to put in a huge development and obliterate the land and so forth. The mandatory archaeology was brought in, the Public Archaeology Laboratory of Pawtucket did the work, and they discovered that this is perhaps the most important Native American archaic site in New England. They were able to block the development altogether, which would have been an ecological and an historical disaster, and the site is preserved today. PAL has also been involved. They're not just hired hands. Uh, they've been involved with <coughs> projects that have been modified again, to preserve the cultural heritage and sometimes the environment. And they're far more engaged in a public way than are the academic archaeologists. I would also cite the example of uh, some other countries. You take Greece, for example, where you have a state uh, archaeological service that really overlaps only vaguely with the academic world. And they have been able to preserve sites. The subway extension in Athens a few years ago um, ended up with some wonderful preservation as a result of their efforts and in many other parts of the country as well. So I think academics either have to get out of academia or partially out of academia and far more engaged in order to have the kind of impact that some of the other uh, agencies are having. Thanks. Uh, I really liked uh, Uzma's point about the inability to talk about a certain future and about a certain temporality through a certain language, which is English. And maybe we should go turn to different languages. And also, I think there's a sort of connection or, or theme here about recognizing silences or acknowledging the inability to speak through our vocabularies, our, you know, the, the, our in our disciplines, and I, uh, this was part of my talk too about not being able to talk or not being to tell something really meaningful that way. Um, but I, I think there are also uh, subtle uh, connotations that we should be aware, and I'm really interested uh, in the, the term hypanthropos or hypanthropos. So I think. Hypanthropos, obviously. So, uh, and I would like to, to know more about, you know, how you see that in, as an alternative term in relation to the Anthropocene. But to me, 
being very familiar with modern Greek, it brings connotations of the subhuman, uh, which is obviously a very you know, uh, racially charged term. Uh, and, it, and actually, it's being used today in Greece by extreme right-wing groups uh, with a very anti-immigrant uh, rhetoric. Uh, so I'm thinking about this ambiguity or ambivalence of, of words, including the one I used, crisis, which has to do with crisis as a rupture, discontinuation, it has to do with critique. It also has to do with judgment, being able to judge. And I'm talking from a modern Greek language perspective now, uh, but you know, I'm, I'm really interested in this sort of thing. And if you could talk a little bit more about this, this term. Well, you know, I mean, the term that, as I used it, was from the ancient. So I was, the, the grounding was an ancient notion of the, the language, and that doesn't necessarily get me out of the fact that it's being used in this way, which I actually was unaware when I did this. I mean, it was also a play upon the notion, the hype, the sound. It's, it, the anthrop Anthropocene has a lot of hype about it, and it's, um, I mean, it, it goes right back to a 19th century notion of evolution. I mean, it throws us right back into stuff that archaeologists fought its way out of for a long time. It's a really difficult thing, and it's one way to kind of come at this on playing with the term itself. Um, I would like to talk to you more about the context in which the hoop, hoopo anthropos is being used within the context of Greeks as the kind of under, uh, less than human. Um, I think that uh, that's where I left Anthropos, is as human. I mean, uh, that term itself, it, it's unfair to amplify it into what, what it's become. And it, it was just, a, it was, you know, off in the middle of a talk about what should we call this? Oh, Hypanthropos, and, uh, hypanth I mean, uh, Anthropocene, and then they start running with it. And there's some serious issues there that we, I mean, it replicates the very problem, a flash that then itself extends itself into the future and affects all of us. <laughs> it's a, uh, it is, it is that. Right, well, um, okay, I yes. I don't, I don't, I don't want to monopolize, but, but I, 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 I wanted to make an observation that one of the things that I've really noticed um, in all of the papers today is, is this, um, this idea of care. You know, that we've, there's been a lot of critique of some of these larger structures, problems, all those things. And then, but, but there's also been this focus on care and empathy. And so your, your question about the people that live a dollar a day, you know, and this idea that, 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 you know, that what makes the difference is, is actually caring about the world. And that's, I found myself struck by your photos as well. It's sort of like the, the beautiful heart, is that how you said it, Francois? That there's something that's so shocking about the beauty of those photos that, you know, that, that kind, of, kind of fosters that idea of care. You know, this is ours. And Thanks. I'm, I'm very sorry, but I think I have to cut the discussion off now, and we can continue later. But um, yeah, thanks. <laughs> um, so we're going to take a little break now and reconvene at 4:30. Okay. See you then. <laughs>